The mission of Jesus was not to lead a revolution against the Roman Empire and establish a political kingdom on earth during that time. His goal was to save Israel from their sins so that they become God's people again. Only his people. That was the purpose of Jesus. But what the apostles never understood is that Jesus did not only come to Israel. They never
So now that you've risen to the dead, wow, you're alive! The Romans cannot keep you dead. The religious leadership cannot keep you dead. You rose from the grave. Now, maybe this is the time to show the world who's the real Messiah. He said, Lord, we're ready for action. Just see the world. Are you going to restore now the kingdom of Israel? Because they're still under the Roman Empire, they're still following, they're still occupying. Are still here? Even up to that point, they did not fully understand the true mission of Jesus in his first coming. You understand this? That is why God has to keep his true identity as low profile as possible. That's why God created a confusion. People are divided. He's from Nazareth. How can he be the Messiah? The Bible said he must come from Bethlehem. But they did not know he was born in Bethlehem. You understand that? So that the people of Israel will reject him. Because if the people of Israel did not him, he would not be crucified. And he's not crucified. But the prophecy of Isaiah 53, that the Son of the Lord, who laid down his life for the sins of Israel, who will never be accepted. And to understand that, even though God moves in your life in a seeming contradiction, trust the wisdom and the plan of God. You may not understand why these things are happening to say that God has every promise of God. The apostles and the students who did not know that Jesus had to be rejected by his own people, that God is given in every, you know, every reason not to believe that he is the Messiah, but confusing them, so that they were rejected, they were crucified, and they did not know. But when he suffered on the cross, he was fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah in Isaiah 53. And I can go there so that you understand it. Where Jesus died, where Jesus had to be rejected by his own people, that he cannot be accepted of the Messiah because of his prophecy. So let's go to Isaiah 53, verse 1, chapter 4, verse 6. This was the secret of God. The story is not to keep the authenticity of two words. You might say that. What are the other words? I'm sorry, I said, who wants to believe our message? And to him, the time of the Lord will be great. Okay, the Lord is spoken by four. In the New Testament, the next verse. He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He has no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people would hide their faces. He was despised, and we held in low in what him in low esteem. This is the prophecy. Next verse. Surely he took up our pain and bore us suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. They did not know that he would never know. God was expecting him because of his goodness to him. God was expecting him because of his goodness to him. But he was pierced for our consequences. He was stretched for our iniquities. The punishment that God has feared was on him because of Jesus' pain for the sins for the penalty of his sins, that he was able to draw us to the peace of his Father, because the blood of Christ led us to be forgiven by the Father, and therefore the blood of his Son to get very much established in peace with God, because of what he did. You understand this? His death and sacrifice was unnecessary to satisfy the justice of God that demands death for all our sins. And in order to see that Jesus became the whole God, he becomes 
Jesus had to pay the price. Do you understand that? And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us. You know, when Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why is thou forsaken me? Jesus said that moment, with the guilt of the Holy Lord, the Lord did in my guilt was not placed in charge against the Son of God. And that's when the Bible said, There was darkness over the whole land from 12 noon up to 3 p.m. Jesus was on the cross for six hours. But from noon, according to the Gospels, there was darkness all over the land. And when the darkness started, that's when Jesus cried out, Eloi, Eloi, la masa bakalu. My God, my God, why is that possible? God the Father was hiding his face away from his son. God the Father severed fellowship with his son because that is death. That is separation from God. And Jesus had to endure that separation because God the Father laid in him the iniquity of his It was the darkest moment of the world. It was the darkest moment. All the sins of the world are now on him. Do you understand what happened there on the cross? Amen. Next verse. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers, it's silent. So he did not open his mouth. He was a shepherd, but also became the sacrificial lamb. Next verse. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. He was oppressed, misjudged. Yet who of his general protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was punished. Do you understand this? The people of Israel in the time of Christ never understood this. Because they understood the Messiah, the servant of the Lord, as a political liberator from the Romans. But Jesus came to fulfill this. If the people had very clear identification of Jesus as the Messiah, they would never crucify him. They've been waiting for the Messiah for hundreds of years. For 400 years, they've been waiting for the Messiah. And they know that this is not the time. They are now at the lower part of the image of Nebuchadnezzar. The kingdom, the iron kingdom. And you know, this is the time when the Messiah should come, and he did come. Not to demolish the kingdoms of this world, but to save and redeem Israel from their sins, because they have first to be reconciled to the Father before God can deliver them from their enemies. In other words, spiritual salvation is more important than political deliverance. Because the root of all the oppression of the world is a sinful nature. Sin is a very good oppression of the world. Human greed, human arrogance is a very good oppression. And it's sin. The greatest tyrant are not those people who oppress others. The greatest tyrant is sin which corrupts us and makes us instruments of evil the 
because we must die. We must be rejected because that is the prophecy. So that we can carry the faith of Israel in the whole of the Holy Spirit and stop her from the faith. So that we can have a good day. Not from the occupation of the Holy Spirit, but the good day to stay there from the most oppressive occupation of the faith. Now you understand why God has to keep this identity of the people. So now you see what was the result. Today, we will be facing confusion of why is that going to be? 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 Joseph had this great time. He engaged in the blood of Lucas. He had a great time to get the blood of the family and then he took his marriage. And this year now, he had to travel to Lima Market and the night to my apprenticeship. And then they had all the children, Joseph had to get this place, but it's not what it is for them. They had to be able to be born. Who of you might have been left with that to be born from a spiritual thing? Do you know when you have a spiritual voice of a spiritual voice? Do you know when you have a spiritual voice of a spiritual voice? Do you know when you have a spiritual voice of a spiritual voice? Do you know when You would want your child to be born in such a single place. You want the best for it. You want the best for that thing. You can not. You can see. But things that the Mary never complained. It would be good. It would be good. It would be good. It would be good. But God was on the face of his throne. God will not use the birth of Jesus to the whole world. And that's where we're going today. The announcement of Jesus' birth has been inspired. This is the first time that God identifies Jesus as inspired by his birth. The second time that God publicly identifies Jesus as his son is during the beginning of his public ministry that is not that is a burden. And when it came out of the river, heaven earth, and the book of the said, This is my beloved son, to whom I love this. God was not hesitated to declare to the world the true identity of Jesus at his birth. So that would be good for the Jews. Because the heart is not the love of his son. And God will let them to me soon. He sent Jesus to bring you to put you in the house. You have to stop the love. It's my stop. He couldn't. Because this is not going to be a mistake. But that's the thing. The Jews were born for a moment. The Romans were not the same. The Jews were born for a moment. Do not underestimate the wisdom of God. When God is moving in your life and contradictory, the ways that you can even say it's the moment you can miss it. Because God sees everything from the beginning to the end. You will only see what is impossible. But God sees it. From everything that you want, it's always the feeling of wonder to you. For you, for yourself. I hope that you can understand me. You know what I'm saying. Okay. Let me see this. Okay. Let me pray that God will give you the heart of faith and significance. Remember the day, remember the feeling of wisdom of God. Because you will just be a long way out of here. 
He needs to have that boring life to be able to write songs for God. And if God is putting you aside, away from the hustle and bustle of life, and you have no choice but to be still, Like that has happened for more than 400 years. And here the angel disappears, and the glory of the Lord, wow! And you say, wow! You know, when was the last time the people of Israel saw the glory of God? Because in the history of the people, that God will go to him after the destruction of Jerusalem. In the Mount of Olives, and then move towards the west and enters the temple, which is not the old temple anymore. It's going to be a new temple that will rise up in Israel in this time. 
In the second family time, Jesus is one of the family by according to Zechariah, who spoke to cast the mark of Eden. And as the court of Christ started to come upon his descent from heaven, in all its glory, with all its angels, the Bible said that the earth would experience a major earthquake if it split the mark of Eden into two. And then Jesus, the glory of God, will move towards the newly built temple to Jerusalem. The next people who will see the glory of God in Christ is the Peter, James, and John in the transfiguration of the mountain. And it's not here, but never Because the glory of God is the same that the glory of God is only in the second time. Are you seeing it? When you come to the Christ, you get the glory for the glory of the whole thing. The glory of God. And you get the glory Every baby is wrapped in clothes. Swaddling clothes, right? Do you know a baby that's never wrapped in swaddling clothes? I mean, if the angel stops there, huh? every baby is wrapped in swaddling clothes. 
But this should be the sign. What is the sign? The sign is lying in a manger. That's unique. That's a sign. I want you to know that this is the third sign since angels start appearing to people. The first angel appeared to Zechariah the priest, announcing that he will have a son in his old age, and his wife who has been barren all these years until he become old is going to have a child. Right? And what is the sign? Because Zechariah was in disbelief. How can I know that this is going to happen? In other words, give me a sign. Why do you have to ask for a sign for something already familiar to Israel? I mean, Abraham was very old when God gave him a son to Isaac. There's nothing new. But in spite of his knowledge of the Word of God, even though he knows this is not something impossible because it happened, it happened to their Abraham, their father, and to Sarah. Why is he so surprised? That's why there is no excuse for his unbelief. And so the angel said, you really want a sign? Here's the sign. You will be dumb and not able to speak until the words I say will come to pass. Remember, a sign is anything that God gives to give you complete certainty about a promise that has been given. A sign is anything that enables you to have full certainty that a promise of God is going to happen. Are you still here? May I ask you a question? Do you still need signs for God's promise to be fulfilled? How much do you know God? Do you believe in the integrity of God's word? Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. In Jeremiah 1.9, I am watching over my world to see, sorry, Jeremiah 1.12, I'm watching over my word to see that it is fulfilled. God is watching over his promise to ensure it will happen. Do you understand this? So, do you need to ask God for a sign? Signs are only for people who cannot believe. Do you understand that? You understand that? But because, Zechariah, how can I know for sure? I mean, sign. Uh, this is the sign. You'll be dumb because you did not believe. But I have declared from God. Are you still here? Okay? See Jeremiah 1.12? Are you watching that God will fulfill this promise to you? Well, rest assured, God is also watching <laughs> to ensure His word is promised. It's fulfilled. Amen? Okay? But God will fulfill it His way, not your way. You understand that, okay? So, the angel's words to Zechariah gave him a sign. And then, he appears to Mary, right? And what was the sign he gave to Mary? Elizabeth, your relative, has now, is now with child. Ha! Huh? That's a sign. The fact that God gave a child to a barren, very old lady... It's a sign of the power of God. So the sign he gave to Mary, for you to have certainty this is going to happen, I'm announcing to you that Zechariah, your relative, is now with child. And, and Mary, the Bible said, immediately went to Judea in order to greet her relative. Are you still here? That's the second sign. The third sign is given to shepherds. You understand that? Then what is the sign? You'll find a baby wrapped in sweating clothes and lying in a manger so that we'll have the full certainty that he is the one the messiah the angel, god wanted to be sure that they identify jesus his son for who he really is but only for the simple people amen okay and now look at this suddenly verse 13 can you say suddenly I want you to know that God's favorite adverb is the adverb suddenly. It's all over the scriptures. Suddenly, a mighty wind surrounded the room where the disciples were, and then tongues of fire. Suddenly. So it's born, born of the Spirit, he said, Gentry. You don't know where it's coming from, you know where it's going. So it's the one born of the Spirit. 
suddenly reminds us that God often comes to you unexpected. Are you still here? When you expect God to come, sometimes He won't. Have you experienced that? You're expecting God to show up and then does it. How many have experienced that? Okay. It's God's style. And when you're not expecting it, suddenly it comes. I often hear men of God saying, you want to experience, you know, God's manifest presence, you must pay the price. Where in the Bible that they say that somebody has to pay the price before God manifests His glory? These shepherds did not pay anything. And then suddenly the glory of God appears to them. And suddenly a host of angels appears. Amen. God wants to show us that His manifestation is never based on human merit. God's manifestation is never based on your performance. God's manifestations are based on grace alone. Listen to this worship team. It's not how you lead worship in itself that brings down the manifest presence of God. That's why there are times you're so prepared and you're so longing and it doesn't come. I mean, experience that. Because God will manifest Himself only when He wants to. Because it is solely His prerogative. Not an obligation. Just because you give some requirements for God to comply with. You will be surprised that sometimes when you're not as professionally prepared, God suddenly shows up. Now let me tell you an experience I had. I forgot where that was. I was speaking in a church. A very humble church. It's a small church. And you know, singing in the choir, old women. They had an old women's choir. And when they sang, I almost wanted to close my ears. Because two of them are singing out of tune. You see, when you have musician ears, anything out of tune just hurts your ears. Okay? Ah, out of tune. I was almost distracted from my worship. Because they, want, they were the one backing up the worship. And two are out of tune. When I was just focusing on worship, you know, suddenly the presence of God came on the congregation. And I was down on my knees. I was trembling. Wow! There was such presence of God in the place. People were down on their knees. And the choir was singing out of tune. Excellence is first of all a matter of the heart. And only secondary a matter of performance. But when you have the right heart, you will have the right performance. Amen? Amen? God still expects excellence. But His manifestations is not conditioned on your performance. As you will boast, ang galing ng aming worship team, binababa talaga, praises the Lord. Ang galing ng worship team, imbis ang galing ng Diyos. Hindi ba? Mas gusto ko yung worship team na yan sa aking event kasi pag sila nag-lead, bumababa, presensya ng Lord, ang galing ng worship team. Do you think that's what God wants to hear? Do you think what God wants to hear from Ang galing ng worship team. Kasi binababa nila presensya ni Lord. Do you think that glorifies God? It's not about your performance ultimately. It's about the grace of God. Are you still here? One more story. Who, know, who of you know Benny Hinn? Now, Benny Hinn has committed a lot of mistakes, okay? Committed a lot of mistakes. Spirituality is not a guarantee for infallibility. It doesn't mean you're very spiritual. That means you cannot err. 
That's why, even though how spiritual you are, you must keep yourself accountable to other leaders. You understand this? But there is one experience I could not forget in his testimony. You remember that he was a follower of a great woman of God, Catherine Kuhlman, right? How many of you know his story? Catherine Kuhlman died. And on the first year anniversary of Kuhlman's death, Benny Hinn, who has been very close to Catherine Kuhlman's crusades, was invited by the church of Catherine Kuhlman to preach Two days before the anniversary event, and then, you know, the, the age of Catherine Coleman was asking him to join them for fellowship at the table. He said, I'm sorry, I have to spend time in prayer. And he could never forget what the Catherine Coleman's age said. He said, you know, Benny, you can be so wrapped up in yourself that God cannot choose you. You know, when Benny heard that, what? in this hotel room and the aide of Catherine Coleman knew exactly what was in his mind he said you know you can be so wrapped up in your own age and you know this is what Catherine Coleman has been saying to us as, his, as her age you can be so wrapped up in your own needs that God can choose you you know Benny Hinn took that as an offense that was the most unspiritual thing I've ever heard coming from a woman of God so So unspiritual! No, I'm going to pray. So he did not take the advice. And so what happened that evening? He came to the huge auditorium of the Catherine Kuhlman complex. Big church. There were literally more than 2,000 people in that anniversary night. And you know, he has been trying to prepare a message in the later part of the evening, in the later part of the afternoon. No message enters his mind. Everything was dry. There was no anointing. He could not feel any anointing. He could not feel the presence of God. And so by the time the time came for him to go, the MC said, we're now going to sing our last hymn. And after we sing our last hymn, Benny Hinn will give us the word of God. So Benny Hinn was outside there in the... You call anything at all. Zero. And he was stiff because he did not know what he was going, what's he going to say. No message. You know why? Because his mind is drained already. Tired. And he was trembling. So when the final hymn was sung, everybody was silent, expecting that little Benny Hinn to come out. But no Benny Hinn came out. Benny was there at the side. He said, I felt like a rock, immovable rock. I could not move. And so the MC said, 
We're going to sing the last part of the chorus again, and then Benny Hinn will come out. So they sang the last chorus, and Benny Hinn still did not come out. Lord, what shall I say? Nothing. And then finally, the MC again said, okay, for this last time, we will sing the final chorus again, and Benny Hinn will come out. Well, finally, he did come out walking like a wooden stick at the center of the stage. He was completely scared. He looked at all the people gathered, around 2,000, and he had nothing to say. Everything was dry. And he was just scared stiff. And he looked at the people, and the people looked at him and waited for him to say something. He was not saying anything. There was nothing to say. So around two minutes, now two minutes is very long for a speaker to speak, right? To start speaking. Two minutes is long. And then the finally three minutes. People started leaving. No message. And listen to this. The Lord finally spoke to Benny Hinn. Just stand there. Lord, is that a message? You said, just stand there. Is that a message? Stand there. And he stood. And then suddenly people started shouting. The lame started to walk. I can see, I can see. The blind started to see. People with pain started experience healing. Miracles started exploding in the oceans. And he has nothing, doing nothing about it. And then he said, wow, God's showing up, God's showing up. And Lord, shouldn't I be on top of this? And then the Lord said, that's the problem with you, Benny Hinn. You all think, always think it's about you and your preparation. I'm showing you it's not about you. It's about me. And I'm showing up not because you paid the price. I'm showing up because I want to. Not because you made me to. You get the message? God's not God showing up because of the way you lead the worship. You make him show up. That's not how God operates. Everything is out of his own discretion. Never under your control. Can I say to the person beside you, God will always refuse to meet your conditions or to be controlled by you. He is God. Are you still here? Do not think that you can merit any manifestation of God's grace or God's goodness. It's unmeritable. It's all grace. And it will show up when you're at your worst. And it may not show up when you're at your best. I know that from experience as a preacher. When I'm too prepared, it doesn't show up. When I'm not prepared, it starts to show up. Because it's about Him, not you. Amen? Are you understanding this? That's why God loves to announce it to the shepherds without any merit on their part. Amen? Are you still here? And what's the final part of this message? Take a look at what the shepherds did after they saw Jesus. Look at verse 16 and 17. So they hired off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Now let's focus on verse 18. Sorry, verse 17. And when they had seen him, can you say that, seen him? They spread the word. Can you say, spread the word? Concerning what had been told them. What are they spreading? The word given by the angels. The announcement. They were spreading the good news 
about Jesus Christ. Now listen to this carefully. It was the, the, at the discretion of God to show His glory to humble shepherds. Because you know, shepherds being humble people, they have no reputation to worry about. But if people don't believe them, they wouldn't care. Because anyway, they're nobodies. Amen? And that's why God chose them, because they were the people who will have no concern for human opinion or what people were think or say. Who's going to believe them anyway, right? <laughs> Who's going to believe them that angels appeared? What are you? You're just shepherds. You're not even educated, and you're talking about angels appearing. That has never happened for more than 400 years. Who's going to believe them? Nobody. Because they're just ordinary shepherds who may be so rich in imagination. Right? And God chooses them for Because they will spread the news out of their sinful joy. Out of their Nothing to protect, nothing to defend, just they want to spread the word. The Messiah has come. The Messiah is born. The Savior is here. And why are you spreading the word about Jesus, the Messiah? Because you're concerned about your office mates who think about you. Because they're concerned about what your boss may think about you. Because they're concerned about your classmates may think about you. Or your, you know, uh, those in your, in your business establishment, your employers may think about you. If you talk, start talking religious and spiritual, they will think you're a fanatic. Sometimes the greatest problem in the service of time is your reputation. Most of you, just like the Bible said, Jesus introduced that he made himself of no reputation and took the form of a servant, a person with no identity in Israel. A servant has no identity. Are you still here? Amen? Can you say to the person beside you, surrender and your reputation to God? Go and spread the good news. Because the first Christmas, listen to this, the first response to the witnesses of Jesus' birth became the first evangelists. The first witnesses of the the birth of Jesus became the first evangelists. And they had no care about what people were saying because, you know, they're uneducated. People won't believe in him. But they will still say it anyway. And because there was the anointing of God in their lives, look at the response of the people. And the people were amazed. That means they believed. <laughs> Even though these people are looked down by Jewish society, people believed them. Not because they're credible, but because they have now the anointing of God when they saw the child Jesus Christ has encountered angels, God was with them. And because they spread the word without any care for reputation, God used them to bring the good news to many. Are you still here? Let me tell you this. The greatest gift you can give anyone this Christmas it's not something material that after a month or so will be gone. The greatest gift is Jesus himself. And if this person has not known Jesus as a Savior and Lord, go like the shepherds and spread the word about Jesus. And I'm going to tell you this. You will have a lasting gift in that person's life that that person will remember forever. And one day, when you come to glory, this person will come to you and say, Thank you for sharing Jesus to me. Because now, we're all here together, celebrating His glory. Thank you for sharing Jesus to me. How many people in your life 
in your influence could say that one day to you, thank you for sharing Jesus to me, or I would not be here with you. Thank you. Spread the word. The first response to the birth of Christ was spread the word. Because this is good news for all the people, not just for you. Don't keep it to yourself. Amen? You want to bring glory to Jesus during this season of remembering His coming? There will be no greater joy in the heart of Christ than when He sees you spreading the word about Him. To your friends, to your relatives, to your office mates, to your classmates in school, to your teachers, to your supervisors, to your business you know, associates, to your employees. You share that word and you bring the greatest joy to Jesus. Because Jesus said, there is greater joy in heaven for one sinner who repents. All heaven throws the biggest party when even one sinner returns and turns back to God because you spread the word. Let me share this. Wherever you are, God positioned you there to give you the privilege to spread the good news about what He has come to do for those people around you, to save them and to give them a new life. There is no greater privilege than to spread the word. Can we bow in prayer? I want you to reflect. If you have not done this before, let this Christmas be a truly memorable one. Spend more time spreading the word. Sharing who is the cause of the season celebration. And tell the people that Jesus loves them and wants to give them a new life. That Jesus came to save them from all their sins and turn them away from all the sins, so He can grant them a new life. That only Jesus can bring healing to their damaged homes and marriages. That only Jesus can bring healing to their damaged lives. Because Jesus came to restore, to heal, and to save. How many of you are going to say yes to Jesus? Lord, I'm going to surrender all my reputation. I won't care anymore what people will think or say. I want to be like those shepherds who have no reputation to protect. And I'm going to spread the word about you to my friends and relatives, office mates, classmates, schoolmates, business associates. Lord, I'm going to spread the word because this is what I know will give you the deepest joy. For it is for this reason that you came to save lives. Who of you are saying today, Lord, I want to spread the word about you. Can you please stand up where you are? I say, Lord, I want to spread the word about you to my friends and relatives, classmates, and everyone that you brought under my influence. Because I want to honor you for your coming to earth. You came not only to save me, you came to save them. And they will never know what you have for them until I tell them. That's why your word says, how can they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how can they hear if nobody tells them? Can you start saying, Lord, send me. I will spread the good news about who you are and what you have come to do for us. I will spread the word about you as the Savior. And Lord, I surrender all my fear of men and all my concern for reputation. I just want to be like those shepherds whom you chose because they were humble and had no care for their reputation. Lord, let me spread the good news starting today. And this season will be something new. Because I will commit myself to share Jesus beginning this Christmas. And in the coming year, 2019, let my life be a channel of the good news of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name.
God's anointing is going to come upon you. Like those shepherds, they had no identity, but there was anointing when they spread the word. And people believed and were amazed. I tell you, it's not about you. It's about God's anointing in your life. And God will use you when you're willing to say, I will spread the word about you, Jesus. Amen. Can I say, Lord Jesus, I commit myself not only this December, but in the year 2019, Lord, to spread the good news about your salvation to everyone in my sphere of influence, that they may know Him and experience eternal life, a new life in you, Lord Jesus. Thank you so much, Father, for the privilege of being your ambassador to my generation. Thank you that you have chosen me to be an ambassador for you, Lord Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I will not hesitate, and it will be my privilege and joy to share you with others because I have nothing to be ashamed about you who gave your life and who loved me and gave your life for me. Thank you so much, Jesus, for the privilege. In your name, I commit myself. Amen. Amen. You are blessed by the Lord. Glory to God. Praise the Lord.